or programming that we're adding to our curriculum to meet the needs of all students, and that encompasses those groups that we see here. And when we're building the budget, we're also taking a look at our enrollment by our different grade levels. So when we're looking at our board priority of maintaining our core academics um, and that Bible curriculum, we even know uh, the student population that exists. So when we look at our K through fifth grade populations, we've got student cohort sizes of around 160 to 200. And then from middle school on, we've got class sizes of 210 to 240. It's important that we continue to monitor those numbers and we have a pulse on that and that we're aligning resources to meet the needs as some of these numbers can improve um, pretty rapidly. Um, quickly, we need to be able to um, adapt to that. So when we bring it all together, I kind of see it as a map uh, of four different steps that is constantly churning through that budget process. So our first step is we're identifying the needs that we have of our students. What are the programming needs that we're looking at? Um, then we need to understand financial parameters. And for us, it's understanding that resource allocation. And that's our second step. Um, then we can go on to prioritizing where those different target curriculum areas um, fit in terms of priorities for investments that we're going to make in academic programming. And then finally, we need to refine the budget because we need to get it in balance to be good stewards to our community. And we can revisit different steps of these four throughout the process, um, but this is the essence of the steps that we need to do to create a budget. And so I put that Vision 2020 at the core of that because throughout that work, we need to be refocusing on what our priority areas are and making sure that our dollars are aligned with what we want to accomplish in those areas. So then in terms of timeline, we're constantly identifying those needs. But in terms of timeline, by the time we get to January in our budget cycle, we have that, that resource revenue allocation and a budget projection. Then during the months of February to May, we're doing that prioritization work of the budget and gearing up for preparing a preliminary budget in the month of June. And then we'll have continued refinement of that as we get new information um, throughout the summertime until we hit October 15th, where we get our final numbers um, for our pupil count, which is September 30th, and our final state general aid numbers, which is October 15th. That's where we get to the, the end of um, information in order to set our final tax levy and final our, our final budget for our school year. Also important, I want to note that the 1920 numbers in this presentation are projected. And so those numbers will change a bit, uh, mainly based on those two factors you see above, the final pupil count and state general aid are projections at this point, um, but will change when we get those final figures. So then in terms of moving to state funding impact, so how does that impact our budget process? So the main factor uh, is the revenue limit, and that's based on a few factors, past spending, a state-imposed increase or decrease on a per-member basis, and a three-year trend that happens in that membership or, or student average. Why this is important is 86% of our general fund, so our operational dollars, are based on that revenue limit figure. Part of the revenue limit is funded through state aid, state equalization aid, and that's based on three factors, shared costs, so looking at prior year costs of the district, membership, um, again tied to enrollment, and then our equalized property valuation. And in this figure, uh, state equalization aid or property valuation is a large factor um, in that calculation. So then to understand revenue limit a little bit better, we've got a simple calculation here. So our revenue limit authority uh, minus that calculation of state equalization aid equals the total revenue limit tax levy. So the tax levy authority that the school board has um, under the revenue limit. And so based on that, um, you can see that the tax levy and state aid are linked to each other. So as one is going up, the other is going down, that inverse relationship. 
um, and for this uh, this district in Greenville, that's been positive in terms of maintaining um, a need for a tax levy commitment in a year-to-year -year basis. And we've got some charts that will illustrate that. So one of the positives has been the increase in student population. So here's the three-year average that's used for the revenue limit over the last 10 years. And you can see in this chart that we've gone from 2,177 to 2,434 as the average number um, during that 10-year span. This is great um, as a school district because the majority of schools in the state of Wisconsin, the majority of districts are at flat to declining enrollment. Um, increases to enrollment allow the district to increase that revenue limit and also are positive for state aid purposes. So to kind of visualize that, we've got um, two lines here. Our blue line is our state aid and our red line is our tax levy. And so you can see um, impact over a 10 year period of that state aid and total tax levy. And you can see in the blue, as, as that uh, blue line is increasing, you can see that the red is stable to decreasing. And so that's the burden of that revenue limit funding coming uh, more so from state aid than from local property taxes. And so that's been a benefit to this school district is as the number of students are increasing the district does better within the state formula for funding schools and has seen increased state aid for the district. So to revisit those board priorities, targets, in terms of the resource alignment, so again, the area is low class size, equitable access to learning materials and technology, maintaining core academics, and maintaining facilities. So what are some of the ways in which we do that? We've got our technology, our one-to-one -one Chromebook program. So students have equitable access to technology um, across the district. Staffing needs. So we were able to operate in a pretty nimble fashion as some of our projected enrollment numbers at our kindergarten and K-5 level changed close to the school year and added sections to have three sections um, of kindergarten at both Canterbury and College Park. And that was in alignment with the board target around class sizes. In terms of our curriculum, um, have invested dollars this year in a music instrument update for grades K through 12. And then one of the largest when we think about maintaining our facilities is we're very grateful that the communities entrusted us with a referendum in order to continue some work maintaining and expanding some of our facilities. So then as we move along from our resource alignment to the actual building of the budget, um, one of the areas that we get questions about, we like to provide information around our open enrollment program. Um, in this year, we project 265 students coming into the district through open enrollment, and then it's versus 410 students in the 2010-11 year. So as we've seen some of those increases in resident enrollment, there's been some less capacity for those open enrollment seats, but for those seats that are available, they're very desirable um, based on the quality of programming in this district. Those students coming in for the 1920 year bring in approximately $2 million in revenue, and that supports depth and variety of programming and offerings that we're able to sustain over time for our students. Um, and the program as a whole, the open enrollment program has added over $34 million in revenue um, since 2004. So our current proposed budget within our general fund, um, it's balanced at $31,614,554. That's a 3.5% increase from last year, the 18-19 year. Our all funds budget expenditures are $58,844,000. 294. Um, I would point out that that's higher than in prior years, mainly due to the additional cost that we we'll have this year to continue on construction as part of the 2018 um, referendum project. So we look at our general fund, our revenues, and compare our 18-19 year with our 19-20. 
Um, again, what we mentioned about uh, revenue limit and the share on the local property taxpayer. So for 1920, just within our general fund, we're looking at a 1.4% decrease um, for our local property taxes within the general fund. Um, and our state share being a 7.5% increase for about $1,195,000. Our federal revenues is a smaller source, um, but we have an increase there of about $40,000. And then our other areas are basically flat and a $6,400 increase. But overall, projecting that 3.5% increase to revenues. So to see that visually, the majority, 54% of those revenues for our general funds coming from the state, 37% uh, coming from local, um, mainly that's property taxes. Uh, the third category is other 7%. A large portion of that is tied to open enrollment revenues that we would be getting into the district. And then federal being about 2% of our revenues. On the expenditure side, we talked about earlier, it's a service provider. So a lot of our costs are tied to salaries and benefits. So the blue, blue pie and the orange, about 72%. Uh, up at the top in the kind of maroon color, 11% uh, is our Fund 27 transfer. And so Fund 27 is what we use for our special education programming. And so we have about $3.4 million that we move from our operations to cover as our local share for providing that programming to students that would have an individual education plan. Um, and that represents another 11%. The majority of those dollars are also tied to salaries and benefits. Um, so we're closer to 80% in total um, salaries and benefits of the district. Uh, in the gray, it's about 10%. That represents our purchase services. So when we think about our heating and our lighting and transportation that we make for students from school to home, that's part of their programming, is about 10%. And then some of our other smaller areas are our supplies and equipment um, and insurance for the district. So we talked about special education and the special education fund. So the total revenues are about 5.3 million and the local transfer of that is about 3.4 million. And what's interesting is that represents about 64% of all the revenues that we receive for special education are via that local transfer. The rest, 36%, come from state um, and federal aids. And so there was a lot of discussion in the last um, budget biennium about the reimbursement rate for special education from the state. And I was amongst other school administrators um, that pointed out some of these statistics that this share has grown over time. Um, what was maybe a third um, uh, local school funded has become closer to two thirds. Um, and we advocated just for that being part of the conversation and very appreciative that that, that reimbursement rate is going to climb for the next two years um, at up to 30%. And we'll continue to have those conversations with our, with our legislators because we know that this is a priority in providing equity and programming to our students. Um, and we don't want that to be at the cost um, of regular academic programming. We want to make sure that we're able to provide strong investments um, across the curriculum for all students. Then we have our two debt service funds. Um, they're numbered 38 and 39. Um, 38 just means that it's non-referendum debt, so it did not go out to a referendum in the community. Um, there's one issue that's older that has to do with Wisconsin retirement system. Um, and then uh, a little more recently, Act 32, which were energy projects for the school district, about 2.8 million, so about $6 million um, that are still outstanding from those two issues. Uh, Fund 39 are the referendum items, so the two that would be notable for community members. Um, high school upgrades uh, remodeling that was from 2007. <coughs> We have about 7.555 million remaining in bonds. Um, and then for the 2018 referendum, total issue will be 33.8 um, million. 
Um, but right now, we've not borrowed all of those dollars. As of the end of June, our last fiscal year, we were at about 20, we were $25,710,000 in debt. And so total debt was $39,230,000 as of June 30, 2019. So we get questions about how is that financing progressing on the latest issue, which is the construction debt. And so we've been able to provide some feedback um, to community members on that. Our target increase on the debt rates, we think about property valuations per $1,000, we targeted about 93 cents. And to date, the estimated mill rate increase is 88 cents. So those borrowings have come in lower. Um, in addition to that annual rate, over a 20 year period coming in lower, um, we were actually able to avoid one year, um, a $3 million principal payment, just based on the actual interest rates that came in. Um, we initially came in very conservative in terms of how it was done, and the actual um, interest rate, instead of being a 4.5%, came in at 3.6 on the first phase of borrowing that we did on the 2018 referendum. The, the debt market continues to be um, at lower rates. And so our projection as we look to January of next year for our next phase of borrowing is that again, we should fall below those estimated figures um, and trying to be as judicious as we can um, in uh, those borrowings um, so that they come in below what was initially um, discussed during the referendum process. So we're able to get some of those lower rates because we have a strong AA2 rating um, on our debt um, and also a solid fund balance within our school district to support that rating. And we'll talk a little bit about our fund balance here shortly. Another item where we get questions are how are we doing in terms of the construction capital budget? Are we on course with that budget today? I'm happy to say that we are. Of our $33.8 million referendum budget, 29.3 is from current construction costs. So that's being managed by um, C.G. Schmidt, general contractor. Um, then the rest of those fees are architectural, furniture, equipment, other fees, $4.5 million. Um, we look at our construction budget. Um, our phase one was $7.4 million, or about 25% of the total budget. Whenever you do construction, you've got contingency. And so of that, we had about 1.4 million as a percentage of overall construction, and only 18% of that contingency has been used to date. So if we've spent 25% of our construction costs, but we haven't used 25% of contingency, we're under budget at this point. And that continues to be our goal, um, to be on budget, under budget as we progress, and to communicate back to our community, be stewards of that, those dollars that we've been entrusted with. Our staff members, our community, are really proud of the upgrades that have already taken place. So here's one of our uh, music rooms at our Greendale Middle School. We had a ribbon cutting ceremony last week, and staff talked about how appreciative and grateful they are for these investments because they understand how much the community values the programming, values, in particular this room, the Fine Arts Department, with the value the community puts around high quality education for all students. And it's, um, it's uh, for me um, as a new staff member in the district to continue to hear that, that positivity and that support from all the stakeholders um, talking about the work that we've done to date. And so I really want to share that staff, um, send that appreciative message of what's been done already. We're also involved in a lot of planning as we look to next summer. And so here's one of our construction projects as we look at our Canterbury Elementary School and our new MPR and new office space um, that will be coming. We're deep, uh, deeply involved in the planning process around that um, and getting, getting ready for bids to go out this fall and in preparation for the work <coughs> during that summer and really believe it's going to be um, spectacular, uh, the facilities that um, we will have um, as a result of that. Another one of our funds, we label with the, the number 50, so our fund 50 is our food service fund. Um, our current fund balance there is $316,000. Um, 
Um, that's really good to have that within the food service fund. Um, that's been built over a number of years. 49% uh, participation rate in the 1819 school year. So we continue to work on strategies to increase that, and that's a self-sustaining uh, program for our food services. And that's important because the dollars that aren't accumulated in that, uh, it's, it runs a negative balance, we need to come from our operational dollars. I and mean, we don't want that to impact food sources that are below the classroom. Our Fund 73 is our OPEB, or other post-employment benefits. So these are dollars that are set aside for future payments that we'll have um, for retiree expenses. Um, beginning of the year, um, trust was 532, um, and ending balance for the 18-19 year was $352,812. Uh, then our Fund 80, which is our Community Service Fund. So this is unique in that programming is designed for all community members. Um, beyond just our educational um, community, but all community members within the Village of India. Um, that's our, our Park and Recreation Program for our community. Um, levy of $561,836 for this year to provide the infrastructure, <coughs> park and rec costs, adult programs, um, and other programming. Um, there's a levy increase that's proposed uh, to support an additional police liaison officer, and it includes um, costs for community events as part of the Coalition on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, they'll be having an event uh, coming up in October, so dollars that are set aside to continue to have um, activities uh, where we can bring the whole community together to continue that conversation. And our energy exemptions, so we had 2014 and 2017, we had resolutions to do energy efficiency work. Um, and so our latest calculation in terms of annual savings is $141,600. So we're happy about the work that's done. Um, Mr. Parnas is here and really grateful for the work that was done by the team um, to do that and make us as energy efficient as possible in this district. So then bringing everything together with the budget for our tax levy. So our school tax levy are those dollars tied to our revenue limit a referendum approved tax levy and then our community service fund and those kind of all build together so we have our proposed tax levy in comparison with the 1819 year so as we talked about uh, earlier you see a slight decrease in the general fund um, to 11 million two hundred sixty thousand nine sixty seven our debt funds increase uh, to three million five hundred twenty six thousand six fifty three that's due to new debt payments as part of the 2018 referendum. Our capital expansion fund is governed under the revenue limit, and that continues to be $200,000 that we're setting aside resources for maintaining our facilities. And then our community service fund, $561,836. That's a 16% um, increase, um, mainly due to those two items I mentioned. Um, so overall, looking at an increase of 8.1%, on our estimated numbers, and a total tax levy of $15,549,456. So one of the questions we get is, how does that pro project with some of our um, earlier projections around tax levy and understanding there would be some increase related to the new um, capital referendum projects? So we projected back in June of 2019, the preliminary tax levy was before we had new state aid estimates, new biennium budget, uh, we were at 16 million, um, 33,693. Um, so we moved from about 11.42% to 8.09. So trending in a positive direction um, as we look at some of our new aid calculations from the state. Um, while these are still preliminary numbers, we're uh, uh, grateful that they're headed in that, that right direction to minimize impact on our community members. So total levy and mill rate. So here you've got a, the blue chart is total tax levy dollars. And then the green, the mill rate um, line. And so uh, we do see the increase in total tax levy with the addition of the referendum um, dollars. Uh, the total mill rate moving from $10.26 to 1085. Uh, so on the next slide, that's about a 5.8% projected increase. 
And so what that would mean on a $150,000 home is a school tax of $1,620 for an increase of $89, assuming that the value property valuation was the same from 1819 and 1920. On a $250,000 home, that would be a total tax of 2713 an increase of $148. On $350,000, total tax of 3798 an increase of $207. <laughs> so our fund balance is the difference between our district's assets and liabilities at any point in time. So it's usually measured at the end of June, um, when it's at or near the high point for the year. Um, but what's important to understand is that in our late um, fall and winter months, that's when we see it at our lowest. I'll we'll chart on that in a second. Um, a healthy fund balance is needed to avoid short-term borrowing. We currently do not in the Greenville School District. Um, and that leads to better bond rating and lower interest rates, which was a significant impact in the, the recent <coughs> borrowings that were done for the district. Um, fund balance is usually measured as a percentage, and current board policy sets a minimum of that at 15% um, for ordinary expenses that would go on in between periods of revenue. We want to create a visual that helps to understand fund balance, um, in particular cash position during the year. So as we progress, we start our fiscal year in July, and then we have a number of costs as we operate a school district before we get a lot of our property tax and state aid payments into December, January, and on. And so we have some low points where we actually cash on hand um, would be under a million dollars, and depending on what, what day that is, that's something the business office tracks very closely. Um, so we think it's a value to understand that that cash balance can vary anywhere from less than a million to eight million dollars, depending on where it is um, in the, the fiscal year. And so then, fund balance dollars and as a percentage. Overall, it's been fairly stable over the last 10 years. There's not been a significant increase or decrease um, in that fund balance if you look at the 10-year period of time represented by the blue bars on this chart. And then the orange line represents the percentage of expenses, and that's varied between 23 and 26%. Um, at about 25% as a general rule, a district can uh, avoid short-term borrowing. So being close to that number, the district has managed to navigate that. So another question as we, as we build the budget is what are we doing in terms of savings? So our, our work around sustainability, um, the district's proud of being a Green Ribbon Award winner, Energy Star certified, um, having a sustainability team that continues the conversation and the energy, waste, and water efficiencies um, that have been done um, to reduce energy costs. We also look at creative ways like local, state, and federal contract savings. Um, we've worked as a district to tweak our benefits um, to self-fund our dental insurance to provide savings without changing benefits um, to staff. Um, and then uh, another area that we've designed for long-term savings um, is a partnership for fiber internet. And so thank you to uh, Mr. Jonas, who's worked on that you know, for a number of years um, to provide that. And so we've achieved lower costs at doing that by sharing the cost of trenching out lines for fiber internet to the district alongside other others. Um, and then are working to create a large cooperative of districts that can create redundancy. So the internet um, will stay up even if one line gets cut, um, but also will provide cost savings by sharing costs amongst many entities. So to recap, uh, our 1920 resident or full-time equivalency. So membership would be up by 45 students in 2004-94. Um, open enrollment budgeted at 265 students into the district. The revenue caps projected to be up by 3.48% or 937,000. Our state equalization aid is projected at a 6.3% increase, 14.9 million. Total expenditures are projected at 58.8 million, um, with the total tax levy at 15.5 million, an 8.1% increase. The mill rate um, projected up from $10.26 to $10.85, um, and fund balance projected at 7.3 million, or 23% of expenses. So what will happen next? 
um, budgets presented to the, the public here this evening with the opportunity um, for that, that vote on the tax levy um, at the annual meeting. On uh, October 28th, the board will <coughs> the final budget for 1920, including the final property tax levy. And so those would be the items for the 1920 budget. And then as we think about our cycle, that will begin for the 2020, 2021 year um, with the goal of having a preliminary budget for discussion on May 20th of 2020, and then approval of a preliminary budget June 17th. So our next step is important that we're adhering to our commitment to prioritize learning for students above all else, and provide a relevant real world education to prepare our students for life in a global society. We want to offer multiple pathways for our students. Um, it's important that education is the highest priority in the village of Greenville. And having worked in the district for just a couple months, um, I can say that stakeholders um, from the village and community members um, continue to talk about the benefits of being in this district and share those positive experiences. And that has a direct benefit because community members, parents are making decisions about where they want to send their kids, where they want to buy a house. Um, and that support that we receive every day um, helps us in that work and is reflected in the enrollment trends that we've had in this community. We're, as a district, we're going to strive for a sustainable mode of operation. So we know current budget constraints and fiscal realities, um, but we'll work to sustain. And where it really comes down to is K through 12, we have to think about that continuum of programming and how are we providing those equitable opportunities for all students, making sure they're ready when they get to that graduation stage, they've had those experiences that prepare them for whatever that future holds. 